it's been going on since the whole history of Nova Scotia. People just don't want to, they don't want to look at it. Human trafficking, a hidden epidemic, but one happening in plain sight. These traffickers are traveling with their victims in public, especially pre-COVID in the airports, the train stations, the bus stations. They're getting stopped by police. So it's really a crime that's happening in the open, I guess is the biggest surprise to most people. Anyone can be a target. For indigenous women, trafficking is tangled with the history of colonialism. You know, the young girl Pocahontas, she was kidnapped, she was exported, she was taken away from our country. Child welfare, missing and murdered indigenous women, incarceration. Over and over again, that was part of the narrative, is that folks had experienced trafficking and exploitation. And I just really want, you know, our young women to believe that they're worthy, you know, they're sacred. When the lights come on and you realize what's going on here, the further away that you are away from your supports, the better for them. Because what are you gonna do? You're in New York and you don't know anybody, which I would say would happen to me. I'm in New York, I don't know anybody. I'm like, and now I've got a trafficker that's beating the hell out of me and making me work every night on the street. And who do I call? This outreach worker has lived experience with trafficking. We're protecting her identity so we don't jeopardize the work she does for the YWCA and the End State program, Nova Scotia Transition and Advocacy for Youth. She says what happened to her can happen to anyone, anywhere. 25 million people are trafficked globally. In North America, two-thirds of victims are sexually exploited. In Canada, 97% of trafficking victims are women and girls. The biggest difference between sex work and trafficking comes down to choice. I always say I'm 100% against trafficking, but I'm also 100% for choice. Now, when I say choice, I mean choice that doesn't come from duress of any kind, choice that doesn't come from poverty. These anonymous notes are written by trafficking survivors and young women at risk. Always be careful. Tell someone if you're leaving with just one person. At RCMP headquarters, Corporal David Lane heads the Nova Scotia Human Trafficking Unit. We can't show his face due to the sensitive nature of his work. Anyone from any background can be a victim, and anyone from any background can be a trafficker. So they look for people with vulnerabilities or weaknesses, and they exploit those. It's part of what they call the grooming and recruiting um, process. Oh my God, they got Amanda. <laughs> the Hollywood version can happen. Someone is abducted, drugged, and forcibly trafficked. It's called guerrilla pimping. The most common way is much more manipulative. If someone who is trafficked is not trafficked by a stranger, they think it's a boyfriend. That's called you know, the Romeo or the finesse pimp uh, technique. You asked about challenges. It's challenging to convince someone that they're exploited when they think they're in love. Lane says it's important for people to know the red flags. Some of the indicators would be that um, their daughter met Prince Charming, uh, a, a new boyfriend that she's totally in love with who treats her better than anyone before. Maybe she's difficult to get a hold of, uh, very defensive about the relationship with her boyfriend. The parents might only meet him once or twice and then the next thing she starts changing her behavior, her looks and moves away. None of that would seem that it's a crime, but it's a lot of the steps of the grooming process. Some traffickers are people that you would never expect. People in positions of power, a family member, other women. 
and then there's the boyfriends. We don't probably don't dream any differently than anybody else. So he became that Prince Charming for whatever reason in this sea of craziness. I go around the neighborhood basically um, as much as I can doing work to talk about the real fear of getting trafficked, how easy it is to happen, the different ways that it can happen. Globally, trafficking is a $150 billion a year industry. We all know that sex sells. Her clients, survivors or people at risk of trafficking, typically range from girls age 13 to women in their 40s. My youngest outreach client or client that I, that the kid came and talked to me was as young as nine. And people, when they hear about sex trafficking and child trafficking, child sex trafficking, they think Philippines, they think um, all these other exotic places or different countries. When that industry is so big here in Canada, you don't want to know that this is going on right here because then you got to wonder if your father or your brother or your uncle is a client. Trafficking crosses class, gender, race, but marginalized people are especially at risk. Our women are very vulnerable when it comes to trafficking, and we might not see it as you would see like in big cities, but it's, it's there. Denise John is a victim support worker at the Mi'kmaq Friendship Centre in Halifax. She says for Indigenous women, trafficking is tangled with other issues. There's a lot of poverty, there's like maybe addictions and mental health issues they face, homelessness. And, you know, they need to be uh, justice for our, our women that are being exploited. Um, just as like our missing, murdered Indigenous women. You know, when our women go missing or murdered, there's, there's that lack of uh, understanding about the historic trauma and there's a lot of racism, discrimination, there's a lot when they report it to the police. Sex trafficking happens in small towns too. In Sydney, Cape Breton, the Jane Paul Center serves Mi'kmaq women at risk. I believe women of Nova Scotia need to educate themselves by sticking together and having resources open to us, like the Jane Paul Center. So as a young Indigenous woman, I, I've lived with the fear that something's going to happen to me. I don't want other women to feel that way, and I know that I'm not the only one that feels that way. So clients come, and they can ask me for, like, they can do their uh, needle exchanges, and I'm here to offer any support that the women need, whether that be transportation, whether that be our harm reduction kits, or uh, sexual health items, um, or anything. The center is run by the Nova Scotia Native Women's Association. It recently received $386,000 to develop an indigenous strategy to combat trafficking. Well, why is it coming out now? Because Nova Scotia is the number one province in regards to human trafficking. Karen Bernard is director of the Jane Paul Center. And we do know who is out there. We do know who is trafficking themselves. We do know who is being trafficked. I have sat in parking lots at restaurants where there are truck stops, seeing some of our Indigenous women walk around these trucks. There are so many traumas that have happened over the years, and it angers me when I, when I talk about it all the time. Residential schools, Indian day schools, the 60s scoop. And our children are exported from their homes. They are taken in exchange taken away from their families, communities, culture, to be educated, adopted, assimilated. And, and this is where my whole piece comes in regards to grooming our people right across the country, grooming our people for human trafficking. And this is where it began, all those factors um, that created this whole allowance to let our people believe that we are worth less than what we are. Thank you.
and then you know the young girl Pocahontas um, if that was her real name was taken away again you know and, and glorified in Disney movies nobody realizes she was probably I believe she was 12 at the time this child was put into a child marriage she was kidnapped she was exported she was taken away from our country so that whole pattern of his human trafficking in the historical piece, that's where it's brought us to today now. Coming up after the break, who's the most vulnerable to trafficking? They want trust, they want love, they want to feel wanted, they want respect. You deserve to be safe. It's not something that we can arrest our way out of. The best human trafficking case is the one that doesn't happen. My first traffickers were women. This YWCA outreach worker has life experience that started at age 13. She says once in, getting out is dangerous. And when I said I wanted to go home, he was like, no, you're mine now. You're basically my property. I don't want to go into my personal horror stories, but give examples that, you know, when I was trying to get out, how badly I was beaten, and that I woke up once when I was, like, taped up my legs and my hands, and then I was burnt with a hanger that was put on the stove. I still have the scars from those. She was caught in the circuit, moved between cities in Canada and the United States. What they would do is book you uh, at these places for two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. So they always had what they considered fresh meat. Trafficking doesn't respect borders. A recent report from the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking focused on highway corridors, the Trans-Canada Highway, the 401 in Ontario. It's about control over the victim, maximizing profit and avoiding police. I would say that's one of our top issues is the multi-jurisdictional aspect of human trafficking. So, um, you know, someone's in Halifax, say, today, uh, we start a file and then they're in New Brunswick or Quebec um, um, the next day. We're well known in, you know, the criminal element for Scotian girls or Scotian traffickers to, um, to be in bigger provinces such as Ontario and Alberta and Quebec. Some of the uh, theories out there is maybe it's uh, an easier sell for an exciting uh, trip to the big city because that's one of the one of many things that the traffickers will do to recruit someone. You know, promise of exciting, glamorous lifestyle that might be a harder sell for someone who lives downtown Toronto. In 2018, Nova Scotia made headlines for its high rates of trafficking relative to the rest of Canada. It's not surprising. I mean, it's a disturbing headline to read, uh, to think that, that the folks in our province are, are super vulnerable to, to being exploited or trafficked. But the reality is anywhere that there's, that there's poverty, that there's community harms, that there's, that there's unresolved um, traumas, and, and Nova Scotia is rife with those. Um, so we create the vulnerabilities the Elizabeth Fry Society supports women, non-binary, and transgender people involved in the criminal justice system. They run the GATE program, Girls Against Trafficking and Exploitation, and last year hired an Indigenous peer support worker. You know, one of the first stages of grooming for exploitation is to separate an individual from their sense of community. And Patricia brings that back in a genuine way. Our emergency bed so it's 
made for anybody that's in any kind of trouble, any kind of trauma going on. So it's just a short term use till we find them like better suited options. I was in the same position not that long ago. Like it's literally been, I just hit my warrant expiry in September. So the girls do feel a lot more comfortable to talk to me because I've, I've actually done time with a lot of these girls that I'm now doing peer support work with, right? White spent four years in prison. She knows how vulnerable women are when they're released. You're getting out to a halfway house, especially as an Indigenous woman. There's no Indigenous workers. You don't have an Indigenous parole officer. You don't have anybody. So like these women that are in prison get to have that elder, everything. So you feel super strong, right? You get to sweat when you want to in prison. You get your medicines on hand. When you get out, you don't have any of that. There's a pattern. Women can be incarcerated, labeled offenders, but with a history as victims of trafficking. And then come out of prison vulnerable again. Over and over again, that was part of the narrative, is that folks had experienced trafficking and exploitation. Um, and that, that's oftentimes what led them to criminalization or uh, what happened as a result of criminalization with the barriers that occurred with criminalization. They become very vulnerable to being exploited or trafficked. Another challenge, putting traffickers behind bars. In Nova Scotia, Corporal David Lane headed Operation Hush in July 2020. Three men were charged in relation to trafficking. But six out of ten trafficking cases in Canada don't make it to court. To actually get a disclosure from a victim is, is in my opinion, one of the hardest challenges for law enforcement. Victims may be fearful of their trafficker, not trust police, or not see themselves as exploited. Lane says the police work has to be trauma-informed and victim-centered. It's not something that we can arrest our way out of. It's, it's the best human trafficking case is the one that doesn't happen. Holly House is run by the Elizabeth Fry Society to help women coming out of prison. Holly House, Carla speaking. But Carla Vino says the most vulnerable group is kids in care. She says youth in group homes in the child welfare system are targeted by traffickers and sometimes by their peers. The youth themselves are the ones doing the trafficking or the ones escorting the, the younger kids because it's um, safer to be the person doing it than be the person put into it. Uh, so group care right now, in my experience, is just the easiest place to go for the victims. We did a focus group. Uh, we made up some questions just to ask what they would look for in a, a house um, if they were going to go live there. They want trust. They want love. They want to feel wanted. They want respect. And again, you're not alone. You're loved. They just, they don't feel it. For Mi'kmaq kids, there's no group homes on reserve. So they're isolated hours from their communities. And putting young people in hotels on their own because there's no placement for them is another avenue for child trafficking and human trafficking or whatever you want to call it. Again, that leads right to missing and murdered as well. I want to make sure that these women have a safe space to come to that they know that they can call and come here when they need to and that we're going to protect them. With recent funding, the Nova Scotia Native Women's Association is working on a three-year project. The goals are prevention and education. What it's going to do is increase the awareness of human trafficking and improve the quality of our Indigenous people within this province specifically. And when we say the education piece, we, we, a lot of people don't understand that whole concept of human trafficking. Our own communities don't understand it. And that's where with my work, uh, I feel the importance of collaborating with these organizations as I mentioned, but also doing a lot of the awareness and let's get the conversation started because once we talk about it then you know like it's not like like a stigma on it 
keeping someone from being trafficked in the first place is ideal. But for those who are being exploited, those survivors need a safe way out. You know, we have many resources that I can navigate and help them through that's culturally sensitive to them, that they're not being judged and blamed. Uh, because we know, you know, when they're being exploited that it's very difficult for them to leave. It's, it's somebody's daughter, it's somebody's uh, mother sometimes, and if we can get them out of the game, it's, it's very rewarding. Lane's team will find victims and reach out, but they don't always succeed. He says because of the way traffickers manipulate their victims, the person being exploited may not see it that way. He wants people to recognize what trafficking looks like. The biggest thing I want everyone to know is that no one would choose this and they might be difficult, they might swear that they're happy with the situation, uh, but no one would choose to be involved in this. Give thanks to all for directing. There are a lot more agencies now that you can go to, but the problem is, is shame. I think one of the biggest things um, within the whole community of people, but even more so within the, the children that are of color, whether it be Aboriginal, Black, whatever, is teaching them self-worth. I, I think that's our biggest challenge, is that you deserve better. I heard once, if you can't find the person, be the person. But when I was 13, I couldn't find that person. So for me, I want to be that person so that other kids don't have to experience some of the horrors and traumas that I had. It was at the end of the shift. Everyone had left the store. I, to this day, still have no memory of how I got home. I just remember getting home and like just taking everything off and just getting in the shower and I just... I already knew, you don't go to the police, you don't trust the police. I didn't feel comfortable because there was racism there. I think it's appalling. I think that it's embarrassing. Canada continues to fail us, continues to fail Indigenous women.